Welcome to this lecture on statistical considerations in simulation experiments. The ideas we look at in this lecture um, are things we have seen before, uh, probably just about everything or almost everything that you learn here uh, will have seen before in this course. Um, you may have look, looked at it previously in a slightly more superficial way. Uh, it might have been in different locations in the course. I try here to pull things together and to look at some of them in a little bit more uh, depth as we go along. Uh, the important point is that when you talk about simulation, you are talking about experimentation. Um, a simulation is a run of a particular uh, model that represents reality. Uh, a, a, uh, but one run doesn't do it. We're running the model for a reason, and that reason includes building this experiment around the simulation model. Um, so if you have only the modeling aspect when you're talking about a simulation, it's incomplete. If you're looking at only the experimentation aspect, it's incomplete because attention has to be given to the model too. Um, so when it comes to the uh, empirical aspect, the experimental aspect of a simulation uh, project, what kinds of things are we talking about? Um, well, some of them uh, affect every single part of the simulation study, and that's what we call a strategic consideration. And um, some are decisions that have to be made as you go along on, in, on different aspects of the study, uh, and those are, are tactical. For the strategic considerations um, will, of course, affect the decisions that have to be made later on on tactics. The strategic considerations are the ones that you want to consider, take care of, at the beginning of your simulation study uh, before you've done a lot of other things uh, that you might have to change depending on these decisions. Uh, you want to examine the simulation model. You want to build the simulation model early, um, and there's really no special ordering in your decisions about the simulation model, the simulation type, the experimental design, and even uh, choosing the response variable. Um, you, each time you make one of these overarching decisions, you may have to then go back to the others and reconsider. We've looked at simulation model building uh, previously. Uh, there are a lot of aspects to uh, constructing the simulation model. Uh, there's the conceptual model and then there's the uh, model implementation. Um, and all of that is in the context of the larger simulation study involving uh, the statistical aspects, which is what we're looking at here. Um, you could think of the simulation model as its own activity. Uh, and by the time you finish creating a model, implementing a model, and validating it and making sure that it matches the, the world is such as you know it. Uh, many people would say that that's good enough. You've, you've gotten a lot out of the simulation. You understand the system and you can move on. Um, if you don't wish to, to experiment with the simulation model, that's fine. Most, for the most part, most of the time, you do want to take the simulation model itself and work with it once it's uh, built and validated. And um, those are the uh, types of simulations that we're looking at here. We have also looked at simulation type previously. So the slide you're looking at now is an overall summary of the kinds of things we examined in the lecture on simulation type. Um, basically, your simulation type can be uh, of two sorts, a uh, terminating simulation and a steady state simulation. The steady state simulation is just non-terminating, uh, which has its own issues. Um, with the terminating simulation, you have a particular event that is known to end the simulation. So you don't have a question of how long to run it. You know when it will end. Um, often when, you, when that happens, you also know how it will begin and you have to set initial conditions uh, at the beginning of the simulation. 
uh, with steady state simulations, um, which are not inherently terminating, uh, you have to decide externally how long to run the simulation. And uh, when you're thinking in terms of steady state, and for the most part you are, you're looking at the results of the simulation and uh, waiting until you get into the state of dynamic equilibrium, at which point you can start collecting uh, the output measures. One of the most important strategic considerations here that we haven't examined elsewhere in this course um, is uh, what are we studying? Uh, we know uh, one of the most important decisions is to come up with the objective of the simulation. Uh, part of that is uh, to determine the variable that we're going to output from the simulation that we're interested in studying. It's usually going to be a, a measure of success or a measure of effectiveness of the system that we're studying. Um, we've seen the examples we've seen, they're pretty much averages, like average uh, size of Q. Um, but it doesn't have to be average. Um, it, uh, it's a, it can be a median. It can be a probability distribution. Uh, the top 20%, the, the, you know, the longest waits, if you're talking about waiting time in Q. Um, in fact, uh, we, we, can, we have seen, you know, researchers have discussed this. Um, you can look at two system configurations and they could be the same with regard to means, but their medians could be very, very different and the median might be more important. The entire distribution might be different. When we're dealing with means, um, especially if we're, if we have our material ingrained from our statistics courses, uh, which this is a statistical experiment, um, we're thinking in terms of the central limit theorem, where everything somehow magically reduces to a normal distribution. Most of the systems we end up studying in simulation are very far from normal. In fact, they're not even symmetric. Uh, just think of a an exponential distribution, uh, and you'll you know, you'll see what I mean. So we should really think more carefully about the possibilities in terms of the response variable, the variable that we're studying. And as we do that, um, why are we thinking of only one? Uh, you, there is no reason in the world that we can't examine multiple response variables. In other words, multiple Ys. Remember that the simulation is an input-output transform. It's an algorithm that takes inputs and produces outputs. Well, you don't need only y vari one Y variable to be output. Uh, we could have several. We can, and if we do that, uh, recall from your other courses that you'll have to um, use multiple uh, multivariate techniques, multiple response techniques in your statistical analysis. This brings us into the topic of experimental design. Uh, do we have one variable? Do we have many? Do we have one X? Probably not. Do we have many? Um, and if so, uh, what kind of experimental design are we modeling here, um, which is going to help us understand um, what uh, kind of output we need from the simulation in order to do the analysis that we need. Experimental design is such a broad uh, topic, we're going to consider it in its own lecture later on in the course. Now we'll move to examine some of the more tactical considerations in a simulation study. Um, these are the ones that are often affected by uh, the decisions that we made when we looked at these strategic considerations. Uh, these are, and this is this is only a, um, a small list, there are potentially many, many more uh, tactical considerations that you can think of. Um, but here's, a, but for example, we need to make decisions about the initial conditions in the simulation run. Uh, we need to think about initialization bias. How are we going to replicate? Uh, the results of the simulation, what methods of replication will we use, uh, what's, uh, uh, what are we going to do about the length of the run 
And that's a decision we have to make if we've decided to do a steady state or non-terminating simulation. Uh, we need to decide on sample size, which actually goes back to methods of replication. How are we going to collect the data? What are we considering um, a, 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 an item in the sample? And then um, finally, of the ones we're considering here, is there a way that we can reduce the variance of the um, sample? Uh, that we, can, we re can we possibly reduce the spread of the data in order to make our statistical techniques more efficient? And we're going to study that topic in another lecture. As you can see, we're pulling together uh, some of the material that we studied in more depth earlier in this lecture on statistical considerations and simulation. And here again, uh, we have a summary slide of um, issues relating to initial conditions and initialization bias. When we um, build a simulation and we run the simulation, we have to take into consideration how that run starts. What time does it start? Uh, we, if it's a terminating simulation, we know when it ends. Uh, perhaps we know the, when it starts. Is there a condition that starts the simulation? If so, what are the values of the state variables at that point? Um, and it, sometimes it falls very naturally into place, especially if we're simulating a terminating system with a terminating simulation. Uh, if it's a, a retail establishment, well, we can uh, uh, we can collect data regarding the number of customers that are waiting at the door uh, at opening time, let's say nine o'clock. How many customers are typically waiting there? Uh, it'll be a distribution. We can sample from the distribution, um, but certainly we can depend on the real system uh, for this data in the simulation. In a, a non-terminating simulation, on the other hand, um, we want to generally, we want to run the simulation until we get into a particular state, a steady state, also called dynamic equilibrium. Um, so even though the initial conditions are certainly important, um, we could start with the empty and idle state. Time is zero, the place, the, the system is empty, um, and um, nothing starts until we have an event that boots it up, an event like a customer coming in or a machine coming in to be repaired. Um, you could reduce that um, circle around the initialization bias by having more typical starting conditions. You have to know what they are first, obviously. So all of that comes into play in a non-terminating simulation. Um, the size of the initialization bias will determine how long we have to run the simulation until we can be pretty sure that it is in this state of dynamic equilibrium. And certainly one way of doing that is to do one long run first and eyeball it, uh, visually look at the, uh, just graph it like we have here and get an idea of where would be a good place to reset, to stop the simulation, throw away uh, the averages, keep the state of the system as it is, and start from there. We're going to start looking at uh, the different ways to collect a sample of data when we're um, doing a simulation, a simulation study. Um, often we need more than one simulation run, and um, one way of doing that is by what the method called independent replications, which is very, very much like uh, any statistical experiment using empirical data. Um, we have to collect a sample of a particular size and we want the data values to be um, IID data, independent and identically distributed. Uh, if we have already decided that we're doing a terminating simulation, well then just naturally this is what we're doing. This method of replications is going to be independent replications. Um, and so we'll do as many runs of this terminating simulation as necessary in order to reach our sample size. Um, it's, this is a nice technique. It matches everything we've already studied in our simulation courses. Um, we don't need to worry about the length of the simulation run if we have a terminating simulation. Uh, 
uh, or even if we decide to do independent replications of a non-terminating simulation, we do have to decide on the length of the run, but we just do that once and then get as many independent replications as we choose. That's a, a little less optimal, obviously, because there's going to be a lot of um, computer time and power uh, invested in it, but it's uh, with the, the, uh, the, the cost of computer time and storage nowadays uh, going down, it's certainly doable. The method of uh, replication of uh, collecting a sample in a simulation known as batch means, the batch means method, is based on one long simulation run uh, which is partitioned into a series of non-overlapping sequences, batches, uh, of equal size, and then a mean is computed of the values in each batch. So that now instead of having a long sequence or a long run of values at particular, as, they, as they're generated, as we saw before, instead we have a sequence of uh, batch means and the idea is to cut down on the order correlation in the data. And of course, uh, there's considerations about the size of the batch. Um, and uh, the, 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 depending on the size of the batch, the um, correlation between adjacent batch means will either go up or go down. We want to make sure that the order correlation is as small as possible. We're going to test for independence, as you can see from uh, the algorithm uh, on the right. Um, but we also want to make sure that it's relatively efficient. We don't want to have to, uh, we, we want to be able to collect the uh, smallest amount of data possible for the largest uh, bang for the buck, as, as always. Um, here's a, a method in which the considerations of run length, how long is the simulation run going to be, and uh, sample size, how much data are we collecting? What's N, size of our sample? Um, here's where they come together in a very important way. Each uh, decision um, is, is made uh, separately, and yet each one affects the other uh, in this type of, uh, in this method of replication. Um, a lot of it is an art. You'll find a lot of um, material published uh, in the scholarly literature and in textbooks on this. Um, we do the best we can. Um, one way to do it is uh, iteratively, in other words, sequentially. Um, you compute, select the, the batch size, compute the batch means, and then test. You know, you might as well test them and see if, they're, if there's correlation there or not, if, they, if they're independent enough or if there's autocorrelation and um, it you don't have, uh, basically we're trying to say that we have um, independent and identically distributed data. If there's order correlation, you don't. Um, so if the test for independence fails, try another uh, value for the uh, size of the batch and do it again. Uh, the nice thing about having data that we generate um, with the computer, as in simulation studies, is that we can do this repeatedly and work towards a solution. Um, another thing that has been uh, um, ad advised, that's a good idea, is we not only come up with uh, batches, sequential non-overlapping batches, but we make sure they're not uh, con totally consecutive. You eliminate some data values in between the batches, and that cuts down on autocorrelation even further. If you have worked with time series data before, uh, you've probably been uh, listening to this lecture and thinking, why in the world are we bothering with making believe uh, we have independent replications when basically we have methods to um, work with to data analysis uh, for, for time series data? And that's exactly um, one of the possibilities, saying uh, let, let's not try to squeeze time series data into fitting into some other kind of mold, uh, we take into, not only take into account, we celebrate the fact that there's autocorrelation in the data, we make use of it and we apply time series methods in order to do our estimation or our hypothesis testing uh, 
uh, in whatever, whatever way we were, we've decided to run the simulation, the to apply to the design of the simulation. Um, of course, um, the calculations are considerable. Uh, the expertise required may be different from what the um, simulation researcher has, and it might involve going to a, another, to a consultant who's an expert in the area. But it certainly makes a lot of sense to take the inherent autocorrelation in the data like this and analyze it, making use of it. In general, uh, the run length uh, and sample size issues um, often go together. Uh, the conflict uh, is very much like what you've studied before in your introductory statistics course. Uh, suppose we are estimating a parameter. Uh, we're going to construct a confidence interval estimator. We want to achieve a particular level of precision uh, for this estimator, for this interval. And yet we don't want to have to um, generate so much data that the cost of the experimentation would be prohibitively high. Um, that, that's a very, very common typical trade-off that we see all the time in statistical uh, experiments. Um, with regard to simulation, though, we, we don't begin to collect our sample until we consider the notion of run length. For terminating simulations, run length is um, uh, organic. Um, the, the, um, there is a terminating event that ends the simulation. This may also uh, involve decisions about the beginning of the simulation run, and we've discussed that previously. Um, for non-terminating simulations, the run length will also depend on the things we've discussed already. Interestingly, a lot of these are uh, the other uh, tactical statistical considerations uh, that we thread through the, the lecture here. Um, there, so we may be looking at the size of the initialization bias. A large amount of initialization bias will increase the length of the run. Uh, the time it takes to achieve steady state, it's related to that. The size of the batch, if we're using the batch means method, how much thinning, uh, what's the size of the autocorrelation, all the other things we talked about would go into determining uh, the run length. Um, so it, it's it, difficult or impossible to order these considerations into an algorithm and say, number one, do this, number two, do that, uh, because um, they affect each other in many different ways. Whether we're doing a terminating simulation or a steady state uh, non-terminating simulation, sample size is going to be an issue either way. It may come up as the question, how many rep replications of the entire simulation will we run? Uh, how many batches will we collect? What is the size of each batch? Uh, so sample size is going to be a problem no matter what. Why? Because this is a statistical experiment and sample size is always going to matter. Um, we could determine sample size in a fixed manner or a sequential manner. Uh, the nice thing about simulation is we have the opportunity to do it sequentially. It's easy to, easier with simulation than with, let's say, a field experiment to do this sequentially. Um, with a fixed method, what we're doing is we're saying we're going to assume um, a known variance uh, with for whatever reason, I mean, there are a lot of good reasons too. We may have some previous research. We may be simulating a system um, that's uh, similar to another system that does have a known variance and so on. Um, so we have the uh, variance we're making assumptions about. We've got uh, the precision that we want, the, the width of the confidence interval. We've, we use that in order to uh, t determine the size of the sample that's very similar to what we've already looked at in other courses. A sequential method is one where we don't know the variance. Uh, we're treating n as a random variable, the sample size, and um, we keep generating data and examining uh, the measures that, that come out of it until we finally decide we're close enough to the sample size uh, that we would like. How do we do that? Um, one method is on the right side of your screen. Um, we have this 
uh, collect data and test cycle. We're collecting data in the simulation run, obviously. So it's a run test kind of a cycle. We collect data, we test it. Um, if the test succeeds, we're, we're finished. If it fails, we have to go back and collect more data. However, we're, we're doing that. Presumably, we have to increase the size of the, of the, the length of the simulation run at the same time. Now, um, what kind of tests are we doing here? Uh, we're testing to see if the data meets some uh, pre-specified criterion. For instance, maybe we have an idea of the analytic value uh, that we're aiming for. Uh, maybe we have an idea because we have some sort of deterministic approximation of the metric. Um, maybe we have a historical output data and that we're trying to uh, replicate. We, we want to get close to it because presumably that's the output from the real system that we're simulating and so on. Uh, so whatever we're using as a uh, determination metric, this test will either succeed or fail. And if it fails, we just go around and c collect more data and test again. We know how important uh, variance is. Uh, sometimes we're looking particularly at the variance uh, in our measures that come out of the simulation run. Um, but most of the time we're looking at means and uh, the uh, means uh, that we analyze, our data analysis, will be much more efficient if we can reduce the variance in the data. There are a lot of techniques for doing that, um, especially uh, in a simulation um, study. Uh, we're not going to look at them here. We're going to look at the various methods um, more carefully in another lecture on variance reduction techniques. Thank you for attending my lecture. In this lecture, we have looked at uh, statistical considerations in simulation because we acknowledge that simulation is an experimental technique and it um, follows all the same guidelines as any statistical study. Um, in particular, though, in a simulation study, we have some uh, decisions that have to be made before others. These decisions impact everything else in the study. And those are what we call the strategic considerations. And they include the type of the simulation. Is it terminating or steady state? Uh, the simulation model itself, the experimental design, the choice of um, the variable that we'll be studying, and so on. And there are obviously more concerns uh, than the ones we list here. Uh, but these are definitely uh, the major ones that we want to look at. Um, then there were tactical considerations. Uh, those are the ones that pretty much can't be made until you've already straightened out the strategic decisions to be made. And those include uh, issues of run length and sample size, initial conditions, initialization bias, and of course, variance reduction techniques.